Hi, we're glad you joined us again for another little devotional uh, broadcast to this uh, little YouTube station. My name is Jerry, I'm pastor, founder, Responding Recovery Ministries, and Jerry Liversage Ministries. Today we're doing just a little bit of a, a broadcast. I have never done one from inside my car before. Uh, I'm at a location. We do these little different formats, either from a desk, office, or we'll be interviewing or different things. But I like doing these little on-location broadcasts, these little Bible studies from different areas. But today in this location, uh, I kind of had to give up the fight with lawnmowers and... Uh, other situations at this uh, community park. And so we are back at uh, Church Street Park, located on Church Street in Rancho Cucamonga. We were here uh, not too long ago, and we were walking through this little journey through Psalm 23. We're going to do it again, but... Um, I uh, hope you understand it's from a car, so this is a little different. Uh, you never know. There may be someone else in the car with me at some point, and we'll do one while we're driving somewhere. But thank you for joining us here uh, again. We're going to come back to Psalm 23. It's a powerful chapter. It's a powerful a few verses. And we're going to come back and pick that study back up. Uh, last time when we were here, we just looked at a few verses, and a few verses that we were uh, viewing, uh, I think we only got to about two verses. So we're going to come back and pick that up. This has actually turned into a little bit of a series. Uh, as uh, I'm parked here in this parking lot, uh, I'm thinking of the beautiful area and uh, some of the rich history that is here in Rancho Cucamonga, uh, California. And it's rich history, much like rich history, wherever you might be viewing this broadcast uh, from. In fact, uh, not too far from here is a museum. It's part of the San Bernardino County Museum. It's called the Rancho um, uh, John Rain's house, the Rancho de Cucamonga, as it used to be. We had the privilege for a period of time being curators there at that uh, beautiful uh, historic museum. But in this history um, thought, I got a little sidetracked, but there's a history in the verses that we're going to be looking at today that uh, we'll pick back up that is absolutely incredible. It goes back... Uh, hundreds, even thousands of years ago, uh, the little King David, I should say he wasn't little at the, the time, a little shepherd boy, and grew to be a King David. Uh, much of the Psalms and the history of, of King David and the profile and his growing up in his early years and eventually became king. What an incredible, amazing story. Well, this little picture where we're looking at here, last time when you were with us and we were studying through these, uh, this chapter, it's only six verses, but we looked at the little bit of a profile of the little shepherd boy, David, who became king, that God had ordained him to be uh, king. We looked at different situations just real briefly in this study of his life, and some of the preparation, uh, God was doing some preparatory things through the little shepherd boy to establish uh, what God wanted to do in his will and his power, purpose, and destiny. Some of the things that, that was preparing David, um, if you know his profile, were not pleasant. I would call it the school of learning, and it's amazing how God puts us in the school of learning does he not situations of circumstances and and trials even tribulations or and even sufferings he allows us sometimes to go through but they're not to harm us 
as the J prophet Jeremiah said in Jeremiah 29, chapter 29, said, The plans I have for you, thus saith the Lord, are plans not to harm you, but to prosper you and to give you good success. Uh, not prosperity and success as the, maybe the world would define, but spiritually speaking, the things of, of God. Well, we're going to pick back up at where we're, we started from. I'm going to read the entirety of this chapter again, and we'll just kind of walk through this uh, um, one more time. It says, Psalms 23, that the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You have anointed my head with oil, and my cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Well, the little shepherd boy, as he was growing to be a man and all the things that God had was doing in his life and the revelation of God's presence and his purpose and destiny where God was leading him. There were so many situations in, in his life, one of which uh, the little shepherd boy uh, had, a, had a, a battle with the Philistine army or the Philistines. And if you recall in the Old Testament, just real briefly, there's this picture that uh, God gave in this battle and the call to King David to go fight the giant Philistine. He was over nine feet tall, as history might record, and some of the um, uh, warfare uh, garments that they had in those days were, you think of things like the medieval times and some of the imagery and the, and the uh, incredible swords and and coverings and sh and uh, armor and such well david didn't want to wear any of those things in fact it's been recorded even that these uh, credible swords that they would what they, what they would uh, use for battle could be up to 50 to 60 pounds a piece depending on the size of the of the person such as this philistine a giant they would wear this what they would call a uh, coat of mail. It's a uh, kind of a mesh of steel, kind of like a jacket, if you will, or covering, especially for the, your front uh, breast area, chest area. And it would cover you, along with helmets and things, but cover you from the slashing of the, of the swords in battle. But this coat of mail, uh, it's kind of like a meat cutter's glove. Your butcher, your local butcher, wears these mesh gloves made of steel, and they protect the hand from uh, the, the cutting of a blade. Uh, well, this coat of mail and this armor and things that they wore in those days could literally weigh a um, tremendous amount of weight, and it would almost, though it would be protective, it would be cumbersome in some cases to the soldiers. Well, David didn't want to wear any of that. And he was trusting in the sufficiency of God. He knew his relationship with God and, and um, he was active in the things of God given his life. And um, through various circumstances, David learned that lesson of trust and adhering and holding on to the things of God. God. Sometimes he learned that lesson in uh, uncommon ways. Don't we at times learn lessons of life? Well, David uh, learned his dependency upon the things of God. And he determined in his mind that he was not going to uh, use any armor, wasn't going to use any swords or 
any uh, particular elements for battle, only that which of a slingshot and some stones. If you know the story, David uh, pursued in battle, and he took this rock and put it in this slingshot, and he hit the, the Philistine giant uh, some nine feet tall, would it, it uh, square in the forehead and killed him, fell to the ground. Many battles, many situations that David was coming in 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 his life that God had allowed. Out of that backdrop, out of the profile of David, we could certainly spend a lot of time that we don't have in this little broadcast uh, on the things of David's life and his preparation as a, as a shepherd and then a, a king. Well, here David is giving this kind of a proclamation, if you will. Last time we started with the first verse, which was, The Lord is my shepherd. And we talked about the significance of Lord and how he became, God became his Lord. In fact, it, it reads, The Lord is my shepherd. It's capitalized in your Bible, King James Version or New King James Version, where I'm reading from or other versions. But they capitalize the word uh, Lord. And its significance uh, basically is in the Hebrew language of the Old Testament, Yahweh or Jehovah. And the name was so powerful uh, in the culture of the day, Yahweh or Jehovah, that it was so reverential and so huge that they would not even sometimes speak the name, just call Lord. So the reference here that David is saying, he's saying the, the Lord is my shepherd. You remember last time we were speaking of Jesus being Lord of our life. Jesus is Lord and Savior. Sometimes uh, some would view Jesus as being their Savior, but maybe not in particular their Lord. Well, Jesus wants to be Lord and Savior. It's a synonymous, really, a, a statement. And as people have said, or I've heard it said before, Jesus is either Lord of all or he's not Lord at all. And this incredible statement that David is making, the little shepherd boy, about God being the Yahweh, being the Lord and his shepherd. And he gives this imagery of shepherd. Well, we concluded with looking at verse number two. The verse number two in our last study was, he makes me lie down in green pastures, and he leads me beside still waters. Before I move into verse number three, I want to finish just a comment on this verse number two. This English construction phrase that is written in our Bible in English makes me lie down. It's an interesting phrase. We would understand its meaning, but to get a, a, a larger picture of the Hebrew language, again, the Old Testament's written in Hebrew, there's one word that is used in Hebrew that gives us our uh, English phrase, makes me to lie down. And just a little bit of a, uh, illumination on that one word, that one Hebrew word, that root word in Hebrew language gives the picture of the animal that not only lies down, but tucks all of its uh, legs underneath himself. You ever seen an animal do that? They just kind of tuck everything underneath. And when they're in that posture, they're in a very restful posture. They're in a contentful posture. Um, you see maybe more uh, uh, birds or fowl, chickens, or uh, they, they kind of nest down, if you will, and you can't see their their uh, their 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 feet and uh, but this is the this is the idea of this English phrase he makes me lie down it's the picture of the animal that's completely his legs are tucked under content he's restful and he's he's in complete um, um, rest if you will well that's the picture here the one Hebrew word that gives us this imagery of he doesn't just make me lie down, but I'd lay down in this rest and contentment 
in the things of God. It gives us a larger picture when David says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down. It's interesting in this contentment and in this rest, as a byproduct of be the Lord being his shepherd, he also says that he makes me lie down in green pastures. And the imagery to that Hebrew language has to do with not just green grass or sustenance, it has to do with new sproutings. Have you ever seen uh, a new, freshly planted uh, section of grass in one's yard? You know, they put down the fertilizer, they water, and the sun comes, and the rain comes, so on. And these new, fresh shoots come up of this grass. The lushness of the carpet and the 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 uh, softness and the tenderness of of that of that grass or that that uh, that pasture area. This is the imagery, and it's it's good to spend time and just come back and study this a little bit more because it gives us this further larger picture as we talked about in our lab last broadcast that. The Lord, Yahweh, was his shepherd, his guide, his teacher, his counselor, his protector. And because of that, there was a byproduct that spills out of that, that is his protection in that he even gives him contentment and rest and sustenance in this green pasture. And then he says, he leads me beside still waters. The interesting thing about sheep, now I've never been a rancher. I don't know much about them other than what I've studied or read. And apparently, as we said, like in our last broadcast, that above all livestock, sheep are the most, forgive the vernacular, stupid animals. They'll run into a rut. They'll run in, off a cliff. They'll just do these crazy things unless they're led by the shepherd. And the imagery of the great shepherd all through the word of God is everywhere, up and to and including Jesus, the great shepherd. We see a great big picture of that in John's Gospel, chapter 10, of our great shepherd. Well, David says that he leads me beside still waters. The interesting thing about sheep is they do not like to or refuse to, in some cases, drink from fast rushing rivers, um, bodies of water that are that are rushing. Uh, it kind of freaks them out. There's probably other reasons why they don't like that that I don't know, but I would suppose if they were thirsty enough, they would probably drink, but not typically. Where they will drink water from is a still body of, of water, a lake, um, water that's not rushing or moving. And the, and the shepherd, the great shepherd, knows that. And he leads them out beside these still waters. He gives them rest in this imagery of like a, a pasture, if you will. But where they will drink from is the stillness, the calm of the water. What an amazing picture. Well, that brings us into our last verse that we'll be looking at here uh, in this study. And we're going to come back and continue uh, in this study. And it's verse number three. We've gone a long way just to get to the next verse, have we not? But it really warrants spending time here and contemplating and word study and all those things. You know, it's really interesting when we spend time in this book called the Bible, we're really spending time with God. See, you're spending time with me right now, and we are spending time together in the Word of God. This is how he talks to us. He talks to us in this book. Verse number three, and there's our last verse. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. That's verse number three. Let me read it one more time. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Now, here's just a couple of quick thoughts on that, and then we're going to need to close this uh, session and we'll come back and pick this study up again. But when it says he restores my soul, it would indicate to us just the word restore is re is is indicating to us that there was something that was there. It's lost its dim or value 
or its character, um, strength, whatever those terminologies might be, but there was something that was once present and then it's gone. And so the word restore would tell us that there is a restoration back to its original uh, a, a form, or there's a there's a, a refilling or a refueling of something that was lost, but now it's found. It's interesting that we see that picture in the Gospels in Jesus' day when the blind man in John chapter 9 was healed of his blindness by the power and person of Jesus Christ. And in that chapter, they were saying uh, um, there was a lot of people that were wondering how, what caused the boy's blindness? How did it occur? Uh, you know, go back and read uh, John chapter 9. There was a lot of discussion that was going on. Uh, they, even the parents were brought in to, to kind of grill them about the boy's issue. And the, and, and the boy makes this statement in John, John chapter 9. He says, this is paraphrase, he says, you know, I don't really know all of the ins and outs of all this, but this thing I do know. I was once blind, but now I see. Do you know that Jesus gives us spiritual uh, healing? He gives us spiritual sight. See, you and I can't even know God. We can't even really have the, the, the correct understanding of God or his presence unless we have a relationship with him. And the only way to have a relationship with him is through Jesus. See, we don't want to just know about the things of God or the cosmos, or the stars, or the creation, and have an assumption of God. We want to have an intimate relationship, like King David had with the God of this universe. And in these days, we have that through the power and person of God, of Jesus Christ, and the, the God that lives, lived outside in the Old Testament, and dealt with man in, in, in the outside form, or the external form, now lives internally, because of of Jesus. And here David is saying, back to our study, as we conclude, in verse 3, he says, He restores my soul. Do you know that God made you in his image? Yeah, it's what the Bible tells us. In fact, the plurality of God created us. What's the plurality of God? God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Three expressed persons in one. There was never a time when God the Father didn't exist through God the Son, through God the Holy Spirit. They always existed. When the creation of mankind, way back in Genesis, the Bible tells us that God said, let us make man in our own image. God created you and me in his image. We now are in his image and we are a three-part being. We're not God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, but he created us in his image or likeness. And in our human likeness, we are a three-part being of spirit, soul, and body. The body being the flesh and the bones, uh, the spirit, that's the thing that gives us life inside. And then more than just heartbeat life, it's spiritual life. And then there's the soul. The soul is the mind, the volitional choice, the makeup of who you are, the, the decision-making process. The, the, that's what stands in the balance, even right now of this, this Bible study. In the balance of, of God and you is your choice, your soul. And if the, if the enemy of this world who wants to steal, kill, and destroy is after anything at all, he's after your soul. He wants your will. He wants your mind. The battlefield is the mind, and he, he wants to warfare after your soul and my soul. But here, David says that the Lord is my shepherd. He makes me lie down in these green pastures. He leads me beside water, and he restores my soul. Well, we're going to finish here at verse number three, and we'll pick up at verse number three. You know, I've given really a just uh, kind of here lately since our last time together, I've given this uh, little Psalm 23, a little series. Uh, a series is just what we work through. We're doing verse by verse study. And the series that I've titled, the series title that I've, I've given to this 
it's and it's just because of what it reminds me of more than anything. It's the need of my supply. The need of my supply. Or you could say it another way. The supply of my need. See, you and I, we have this incredible need. Oh, we have a need to breathe. Aren't you glad you're breathing? This need for sunshine and water and food and all these things. But you know what our deepest, most greatest need is? A relationship with God. Because statistics are pretty good. One out of one will get sick and die. There will be an eternity to spend. Every last man, woman, boy, and girl on the face of this earth will spend eternity somewhere. Oh, I want to spend eternity in God's kingdom, and I want God's kingdom to reside and live in me now. Now. I have that dis desperate need to have a relationship with God. And he's the only one who can supply it. So I have a great need in my supply. In his, in, excuse me, in his supply. Or I have a deep supply that I'm in need of. You can see the different way of constructing the series title. As I'm wrapping up here in this setting, here in Rancho Cucamonga from a car, um, it's just you and me and it's the Lord. And he's asking you and me today, is my relationship abiding and living in you? Just a question that we ask ourselves. If you have not made the decision to, to begin this journey with God in Jesus Christ, you can do that right now. God has made available to us this book, and he's made available to us all of himself in all of the flesh of Jesus, 100% God in 100% man. And though the blood of bulls and goats in days of old, in the Old Testament days, as we read from King David in those times, and they were appropriate for the hour. The, the fulfillment to all of that now is in the person of Jesus. And our focus and our attention now is on the power and person of Jesus Christ. Do you have him? Oh, you can have him right now. And you could just pause for a moment and say, Jesus, live in my heart. I want you to cleanse me of all sin and live in me, take up residence in me, that I wouldn't just read these words from King David of old, but I would know these words, that you are my shepherd. And you're taking the want and the strain away from my life. And I don't want to be wrapped up in the things of the world. I, I, I want to be wrapped up and tangled up and tied up in, in you. And knowing that, you could, you'll make me to lie down in these green pastures and these still waters. And, and I'm calling upon you to restore my soul. In your powerful name I pray. Amen. If you prayed that prayer and if you believe this power of this word that we just read and spent some time with, boy, we'd like to hear from you. Talk to your Christian brother or friend, your pastor, uh, even contact through us on the website. But um, just know that the power of this word is for you. And I want to thank you for joining us. <laughs> God bless you. We'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.